them loot, them loot, them loot. Oh, them loot, Zimbabwe dry. Them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. Oh, how the people die. Them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. No medication in hospitals. Them loot, them loot, them loot. Schools have no books. Them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. The ghetto youth have no jobs. Them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. Lord of mercy. Them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. Oh, them loot, them babies cry. Lord of mercy. God have mercy. Them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. Them loot, them loot, them loot. Oh, while the people cry Vanoba, 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 vanoba Jipata rasisi na mushonga vachiba Vanoba, vanoba, vanoba Jikoro zisi na mapoko vanoba Vanoba, vanoba, vanoba Bechi diki vachisha ya mabasa vanoba Kadampura hakuna vanoba Lord of mercy Lord of mercy Masibamba neni Tina songe Katibata neni Right, good afternoon, uh, workers of Zimbabwe. Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to the worker dialogue. Today, we have got a special segment the beginning of our political economy series. And we have got uh, the topic, cartel power dynamics in Zimbabwe expose what must happen. We are fortunate to have a panel of eminent Zimbabweans, uh, powerful um, activists in their own rights and uh, lecturers. We have uh, Prof. Maduk, Professor Maduku, and we have Dr. Alex Magaisa, and uh, Comrade uh, Tandeki Lemoyo to look at the expose that was um, uh, published by Daily Maverick, but broadly to look at the issues that are bedeviling this country. The Worker Dialogue Platform is a platform for trade unions, uh, the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions. We use this platform to engage with policymakers, to engage with uh, opinion leaders and various experts in various uh, fields. The purpose of this uh, platform is to inform workers and to inform trade union leaders, and also to have a dialogue with trade union leaders and with citizens, Zimbabwean citizens as a whole. So we use this platform to shape our policy making, our decision making, and also to convey the various positions of this SCTU. I don't want to waste time. May we go to the panelists and uh, ask the comrades to greet uh, viewers, to greet workers and citizens of Zimbabwe. Uh, comrade uh, Tandekile. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Magaisa. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you are well under the circumstances. I'm happy to be here to share some thoughts with you and uh, these fellow comrades. Prof. Maduk. Uh, hello, everyone. A uh, good afternoon to everyone. I am happy to be with you. Thank you very much. So we intended to, in, we in fact invited the, the ZANU PF Director of Communications, uh, Mr. Mgwadi, but for personal and professional reasons, he excused himself, himself and promised to come in the next dialogue when we engage political party leaders hopefully we'll get all of them 
But let's let's go straight to the issues, uh, comrade. Um, we want to be broad as we start the dialogue and look at the issues broadly. And I would want to ask uh, all of you this question uh, and starting with uh, maybe the powerful lead with, with us today, Comrade Tandekile. What do you regard as the national question that Zimbabweans must unite to address currently? Um, I think the national question should be what is our responsibility as citizens uh, in this environment of state capture and state collapse? Thank you very much. Um, and we'll, we'll look at that uh, further. But let me go to Prof. Maduk. The same question. Um, let's engage. Yes, I think uh, the national question, framing it differently, to still come to what um, she has said, but for me, the national question is how best can we make the lives of all Zimbabweans better and worth living? That's how, how best can we make the life of our Zimbabweans, all Zimbabweans, better and worth living? That's how I would put it. All right, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Dr. Magaisa, what are your perspectives? <laughs> well, I think that um, it, it's very similar to what what my colleagues have said. Um, I would um, put it metaphorically as saying, uh, how do we as a nation get out of this hole? We are in a hole, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, we can either continue to dig, you know, deeper into the hole, or we can get out of it. And I think that the national question is, how do we stop digging like we've been doing for the past, you know, 20, 30 years? And how do we, how do we start, you know, getting out of this hole? You know, so it's a metaphorical, uh, you know, expression of uh, the myriad of challenges that we are facing as a nation, uh, some of which are self-inflicted, some of which we can resolve. And that's why I think it's important to to ask uh, how do we get out of this hole? For me, that is the sort of encapsulation of the national question. Wonderful. And um, if I take the three responses, we they all sum up to the point that we have a, a crisis. We have a problem as a as a nation, but let's let's go deeper and look at uh, uh, Prof. Madhu in your view. What what has gone wrong? Why are we in this crisis? Prof. Madhu, is your mic your mic not on mute? I think we have got a network challenge with Prof. Uh, what, what are your views? Why are we in this crisis? What is wrong? Uh, okay. okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so I, I think what has gone wrong is that uh, our country has had a history of violence since independence. And because this violence has been targeted at different populations at different times, we have failed as a country to unite against the perpetrators of this violence. So if we look at the fact that uh, soon after independence, we had Kukurahundi, but Kukurahundi was concentrated mostly in Matebeleland and the Midlands and did not affect the rest of the country. So we had people in Matebeleland and Midlands fighting this violence and this genocide that was taking place, but doing so without the support of Zimbabweans as a whole. And in 1990, we had the same thing happening when Zoom uh, tried to contest against ZANU-PF and ZANU-PF then targeted the violence at Zoom and Zoom fought on, on its own without the support of all Zimbabweans. This happened again in 2000. MDC came up, the violence was targeted at MDC supporters, and it was a fight 
uh, MDC had to fight Zanu on its own. So we've had this happen over and over again. 2008, we, we had the same thing. We then had Mramba China. And, and so uh, I believe what is happening is that ZANU-PF has realized that they can continue their reign of terror as long as the, the, the violence happens to different parts of the population at different times meaning that uh, it's unlikely for the whole country to rise up against them as a whole. But they have done that for so long to the point that we are now at a point where almost everyone has been affected. Political players have been affected. Ordinary citizens are also being affected. So I think the place we are at now is right for a consolidation of efforts in a bid to free the entire country from 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 the oppressor. Yeah, quite powerful there. I think we have to revisit um, uh, the polarization that we have spoken about and why an in post-independent Zimbabwe is not dealt with violence. But uh, Dokma Gaisa, you uh, listen to Tandekile. Do you agree with um, Tandekile and uh, they are the factors as well? Yeah, of course. Thank you very much, um, you know, for that. Um, I think that, um, you know, Tandekila makes a, a fundamental point. Um, we, we, are, we are a traumatized nation. Uh, what she makes reference to concerning the genocide in, in Matabeleland in the 1980s, uh, concerning the violence that we have seen, political violence we have seen, you know, in elections and, and other, you know, even between elections, you know, this is a result of, um, you know, trauma that is unresolved. But I don't want to locate it only in the post-independence era. I think that we have to go back uh, to the pre-independence era. I think that our nation has been a nation that was, you know, it was a nation that was born out of violence. If you consider, um, you know, going back all the way to 1893, you know, there was egregious violence, looting, you know, the looting we talk about today, you know, did not, uh, you know, start yesterday. We have, you know, empires that were built uh, on looting, you know, who, you know, with all due respect to big empires like uh, uh, Mikus, you know, we, we, you know, they all got a lot of wealth uh, from looting. You know, King of Angola's ghetto. Uh, there were loot committees then. So, so the violence is not new. We are a nation that has been, you know, uh, 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 you know, sort of blundered by violence and traumatized. And and it almost seems normal that uh, if someone is, disagrees with you, the best thing to do is to pick them up. You know, it's considered normal, and and, and that's why you know, you know. It, you know, it's part of our life, and, and I think that we need to resolve that. But I want to extend it a little further uh, and say that um, we have a crisis of governance, you know, as a, as a nation. Now, I can see that it's a very big and amorphous term, but it manifests in many different ways, you know, socially, economically, and politically. You know, politically, our country is in disarray. We have a state, but we have been plagued by the problem of illegitimacy for the better part of the of our independence and i think it's a problem that arises from the contested nature in which the results of elections come through professor maduka and i have participated in a different forum or different forum before and i think that um, at some point we'll talk about solutions we, we might come to you know point about how can we resolve the political system and I think there are certain points of agreement between us on, on how we can find a way of resolving this political challenge that we have. But economically, you know, we have serious problems as a nation, uh, not because we don't have resources. You know, we are a country that has a lot of resources, you know, like any other African country endowed with huge amounts of mineral resources. But our failure is not even recognizing what we have and when we do recognize what we have, we don't know what to do with it. A, a few people, elites, both local and foreign, are the ones who are benefiting from these resources. You can imagine 
uh, uh, president, Marangi, the Marangi diamond. They could have changed the fortunes of, you know, not just people of Mutari in Malikaland, but the entire nation. Uh, but they were plundered by just a few people. And, and that's a, a, an indictment on, on the leadership. Our inability to manage resources for the good of all, but also the greed and avarice that we see. I just want to conclude this bit uh, by saying what we are witnessing in Zimbabwe or the crisis that we have in Zimbabwe is not new. You know, it's a uh, many African countries after independence have gone through this crisis. And one of my favorite books, which I'm sure you know very well, uh, and, and some of your uh, listeners may know very well, and if they don't, I would encourage them to, to read it, is a book by Franz Fanon. Uh, the Wretched of the Earth, you know, one of his, the most fascinating chapter that he, he has is, is one called The Pitfalls of National Consciousness. You know, if you read that, it was written in 1960, 1961, but he might as well have been writing about Zimbabwe in 2020, you know, Zimbabwe having gone through 40 years of independence, you know, how the liberators, you know, come in, take office, but their only purpose is to step into the shoes of the former colonizers and to do exactly the same things that the colonizers were doing, but not only do the same thing, but do it worse, you know, uh, exploit workers, uh, self-aggrandizement, uh, you know, primitive accumulation, you know, abuse of resources and the desire to build huge mansions, useless buildings, the desire to be seen with Lamborghinis and, um, you know, Rolls Royces, Phantoms and whatever, it, it, it's all written, you know, this was all seen, you know, Franz Fanon might as well have been a prophet. But that is the challenge that we have as a nation. We have not learned from the mistakes of others. If anything, we have learned from all those who have come before us in order to repeat those same mistakes. And, and we are excelling in making those mistakes, unfortunately. Oh, thank you very much. Um, a traumatized state and the crisis of governance. Now we have lost you. It looks like the host has been frozen. Uh, Tadeki, are you, are you there? I suppose you might feel I can hear you. Okay. Ah, good. Maybe, Prof, you can go ahead and say something since you were you were supposed to go first. While we wait for him. Oh, yeah, that, that, okay, while waiting for the host. No, no, I'm saying that you can go yeah. ahead and say something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely I can then come in. I've listened. I think I missed a bit of um, what Sandy Clear was saying, but I got everything that uh, Dr. Magaisa was saying. Mm -hmm. And that, yes, yeah, so what, my contribution to this whole thing, in addition to what has been said, uh, I want to introduce a concept of uh, somewhat uh, of a happened is that uh, I think from about 2000 up to now, the general Zimbabwean approach has been to leave um, contestation around what to do and what ought to be done to the two political formations that were then uh, in force at the time. So we tended to leave um, our entire issues in the hands of the political class. Then in the process, one side of that political class, which is Zanopier, decided that its way of running this country was to engage in uh, the aspects that we have seen. Uh, what, um, Alex, you have indicated in terms of the culture of corruption, what also has been happening, even technically talking about violence and the extreme levels to which it went. And then somewhat the public was always trying to come out through its political voices. So you would either say I'm on this side or on this side or whatever ideas we had, you have to channel them through the political class. And, and there we must have then lost public engagement in these issues. I think that we must continue to have a third element, which is the public, the non-partisan political framework that goes to tackle 
issues of corruption and to tackle everything by other political means other than waiting every five years to cast a vote. I think that uh, we must more have more and more, like the debates we are doing is that these are very important contribution to the discourse because we are putting it out there to people. I mean, ordinary Zimbabweans must be given access to what is being debated and what solutions are being suggested by those who speak publicly. And then we should then have, you know, the communities coming up with more and more noises about certain issues. I think that it might improve our political situation. Uh, thank you, Prof. I'm, I'm not sure if um, uh, the, our host, the ZCTU president, has joined us, uh, but we might as well go ahead since we are available. Uh, Kandikila, maybe you might, uh, you know, come in and uh, maybe say something about uh, maybe focusing on the on this expose which was done by uh, Danny Maverick. Maybe your, your views and thoughts on it. I'm sure that's what people want to hear. Okay, so I think what this expose has done is uh, put together in one report things Zimbabweans have been hearing about for so long. You know, we have always known that we are led by criminals whose main goal is to hold on to power in a bid to hold on to their wealth. You know, so we have always known that. But what this report has done is to put together in one comprehensive document examples of exactly how these people are holding onto power and, and exactly what they have to lose if they are removed from power. That, that is uh, what, what really stands out to me from the document, what these people have to lose if ever they are, they are removed from power. So this report, by explaining to us cartel power dynamics and explaining to us how these cartels uh, have been looting from the people of Zimbabwe, shows us that for the cartels to be able to loot, it means that certain people must remain in power. And this is the reason why we see the same players holding on to power at all costs from 1980 to date, because if they are ever to be removed from power, it's not just them that are going to lose, but it's also these cartels that are surviving by having them in power. So I think what this report should actually, uh, what we should do as Zimbabweans is to try and get this report out to as many people as possible so that they understand the, the, the dynamics of cartel power in Zimbabwe. Because all of us know that these people loot, all of us know that this, this party is violent, but we need to understand why are they violent? What is it? What is at stake for them? If they stop the violence, what happens? And once that happens, once we get that understanding, we will realize that there is no way Zanu PF is ever going to reform. It's impossible for for us to expect people that are, that are in power to loot people that have that have um, that have looted so much over the past forty years that they don't know any other lifestyle except to loot as much as possible from Zimbabwe. So we have people in power that now have to protect their wealth. Not only that, that have to prevent being arrested. And what that means is that if these people give up power, they're going straight to jail and they'll never do that. So I think Zimbabweans have to accept that no reforms are coming. And the only way these people are ever going to get out of power is if we find a way as Zimbabweans to force them out of power. <laughs> Thank you, Chandel. Uh, Alex, I sure. can come in. Yes, sure, exactly. I was hoping that you could do it since we still have you. <laughs> the network. Thanks, exactly. Of course, I also wanted to come in when my network is... Uh, unfortunately, the area where was, yeah. it was raining and so on, and it has affected my network. But let oh, me yeah. come in. I agree with what she has said. My contribution on this topic uh, is as uh, follows. I think clearly what you get in that report is the kind of um, uh, facts, the kind of situation that uh, most people have always known. I think the extent 
or the degree of intricacies, what came out there. But we have always known that um, this country is run by people who have no interest in the general welfare of everyone, that their only interest is in themselves. So when that is said, we, the manifestation of it is what you get in that report. But what I want to then focus is how do you get them out of power? Because we have to get them out of power. And this is where I want to link what I've said before and what I'm now saying. Obviously, if you are run by a corrupt authoritarian regime, you are run by a cartel of self-centered people, your goal as a society is to get them out. Uh, even if they were not as extensive as that, if you are led by a person that you do not want, or a person that you feel is not competent, or a person you feel is not addressing your concerns, your goal must be to remove them. So focus must be on how do we go about removing these people. First, in the <clears throat> developed the democracies, uh, even the most powerful get removed from office through uh, the very simple device of an election. I think we saw that uh, with President Trump. Uh, four years there, very powerful, but what happened, I, we know that through an election, he uh, lost an election. There are issues to do that. We would obviously ideally think that uh, let's prepare ourselves for election. So I would still say that our election, even when things are bad, let's still try to open up the avenue of an election. But I agree that it would be very difficult to have a free and fair election with this cartel, which takes me to the second way of doing it, which must be married to the first one. The second way of doing it is what Anakla said. We must expose these people in risky ways across the domain of the country. People must know the extent of the corruption. People must know the extent of um, how bad these people are. People must also be told that their only way out is to remove them. And then to tell people there are two ways of removing people. Either you do mass uprising or mass uh, action, which removes people, or you ensure that at the next election you remove them from power. That's my so I would believe that our first option now would be to popularize these reports as much as possible and get to say to people it's risky. Like she says, they will never. To say never means they will fight back. And they are already fighting back in many ways. So people will know the risks they are involved in this. And then uh, know that you have to pay surprise. And this is a political game which has to be played by civic society and the political parties. Then we should still open election for the next election, to hoping that it will be better and so forth. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. Maduku, and thank you so much, Tanekile. Um, uh, uh, Comrade Mutasa, I just wanted to say we had, uh, we had taken over, <laughs> so we are discussing <laughs> We are discussing uh, in the interest in the interest of ZCTU, of course. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, we we are discussing the the report and uh, the two comrades have just uh, given a, uh, their views on what it means and what needs to be done. So I'm just going to say uh, something to complement what they've already said, and then you can you can come in. Uh, so for me, the report by the Daily Maverick uh, does precisely uh, what uh, Tadekile and uh, Prof. Duke have said, which is that it tells us things that we, most of the things we already knew, but they were scattered all over the place. But it has brought them together and given a complete picture of how things are, you know, the extent of corruption and looting in our society. Uh, but what, what needs to be done is to make sure you know, that this report or information like this is brought forward to the people. You know, right now, you know, I've been going through the uh, Willowgate report, the commission, uh, Sandura Commission, just going through the report to understand, you know, what happened then because I want to write something for my column on, on Saturday. And uh, so, you know, especially for the young people, because I discovered that a lot of young people have no idea what was going on in the 1980s, just as they don't know much about Google Audi, they also don't know much about, you know, the corruption that was taking place then. And it is up to us to share that information so that everybody becomes more conscious of the beginnings 
or the genesis of the rot, you know, in, in their country. Uh, we have had scandals like the farm mechanization scandal, the war veterans, you know, compensation scheme, the VIP housing scheme, so many more of those which, you know, really demonstrate the greed uh, 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 that, that, that really drives these people who are in power. And, uh, you know, I think that for me, another important factor in the report is the issue of illicit financial flows. We are always told by this regime that people are externalizing funds and you get people who are arrested on this and that, very often it goes nowhere. But the reality is that illicit financial flows are actually being perpetrated by the people at the highest level of government uh, by their friends and associates, the politically exposed persons, the perhaps, and also people in the private sector. And I think that it's important for people to understand that power is not just being abused at the level of the state, but also in the private sector and in what I call the unelected layer of government. You know, those senior civil servants, they sit on boards of parastatals, they sit on, you know, in the civil service. They're there, quiet, you know, eating, you know, eating a lot, you know, of the national cake, you don't see them mm -hmm. as much as you see the politicians. But they're there. Yes. You know, they're also business people who are part of these cartels. And I think that the report does an excellent job of showing the extent of corruption that is just not in the public sector, but also in the private sector. And it needs to be exposed. So there we go. How do we expose it? And this is where I have a problem with ourselves, with myself, and with everybody else. You know, we are taught uh, in the language of English, and uh, it is the language that we use to communicate with each other. And uh, I would so love to have someone who is, uh, you know, fluent in Shona or Sindavele or Tidau to translate my big salad week, because it's something that I do on a voluntary basis, I don't have a lot of time. I can only write it in the language that I use every day, which is English. But in order for this to go out to the people, you need it to be translated into these languages. And that's the same thing for me with this report. This report would be much more powerful if it is communicated to the people of Zimbabwe in the languages that they understand. But that's only one thing. The other one is also in the medium that they understand. So you need to take snippets of this report. You know, Zim Daily, well done for hosting this discussion, but you know what? It's not good enough to just report that there is a report that has been published. Take part of it, do audios, you know, share those audios, because it is those audios that go out to the WhatsApp groups. You know, share them in English, share them in Debele, share them in Shona, share them in any of the languages that anybody can use, because you want people to know and to understand how the looting is taking place. I mean, imagine if you explain to them, to the tobacco farmer, how the looting is taking place, that the tobacco that they toil, you know, all year round, put in a lot of labor, cut down trees and so on in order to produce. And they are told that it's going to China, they are given a few US dollars or even Zimbabwe dollars in return. But actually the beneficiaries are some middlemen out there who don't, not much of an effort, but they are making huge amounts of profit out of their labor. I mean, imagine if you if you captured that information, you know, ZCTU and shared it with your workers, with everybody, so that they understand. Maybe, maybe people will get a little bit more agitated and understand, you know, that this lot is not interested in them. That if they have to do anything, it is up to them. They cannot outsource their responsibility, I think, to quote what Professor Maduko was saying, you can't leave this to Zanu people for the MGC. It has to be done by the people. I always, you know, laugh when people say, oh, wait, the opposition. You are the opposition. You know, you are the people who are supposed to, to do this. Look at what Hopewell has done. You know, he just sat on a desk in front of a computer, you know, did a, a few rhymes, you know, jam loot, and now it's, a, it's, it's like an anthem. But it's, it's an anthem that is communicating not only to the international community but to all the other people. I'm hearing two year olds and you know five year olds you know doing dead looks, you know, because it's it's a catchy thing. But that's how you communicate with people. You need to be innovative. 
You need to be creative in what you do. Right. Uh, welcome back. You are watching Zim Daily. Uh, we are coming with this production in collaboration with the Zimbabwe Congress Trade Union. Unfortunately, um, the ZCDU president dropped offline because of electricity challenges with the rains electricity is going like on a regular basis but all the same the conversation continues thank you so much dr magaisa for continuing with the conversation when uh president Mutasa dropped his line there so we are talking about the report that has been released by the mother group and uh, we are looking at um we're just getting the impressions that we got from reading that book. Now, the biggest challenge, um, which is something that you raise, um, my panelists, you talk about people need to be informed about the extent to which this damage has been done. But my greatest challenge is that I think the people, the report simply spoke about the things that everybody in Zimbabwe actually knows about. Everybody who has any interest in the happenings of Zimbabwe knows about. So it's not like people are not informed about even the extent to which the damage is done. Maybe the question is, does a person understand the extent to which this seemingly divorced damage can do to their personal lives. I don't know, Tandekile, you're a journalist. Um, are you not, as a media fraternity, educating, informing, uh, keeping the nation in the know of the things that are happening? Well, what I've realized uh, from being a writer is that um, they there's there's nothing called over information and i don't think there's there's ever been a time where anything i've written has reached everyone i intended it to reach so as makaisa was saying earlier we really need to find ways of making sure that everything we do reaches the rest of the population because Every time I post something that I've written, I seem to get feedback from the same people, meaning that I am writing to the same people over and over again. And just as much as this report, in my opinion, has only been read by the same audience that we have, that, that we've written for uh, as writers and journalists uh, in, in the past few years, well, in the past decades, and um, I don't think many people realize that very few people have access to, to, to social media in, in Zimbabwe beyond WhatsApp, you know. So the things that we write that get published internationally, that get published in our independent newspapers in the country actually do not reach as much of the population as they should. So. Magaisa's uh, request of people translating these articles into local languages would actually go a long way because it means that even our go go in the rural areas, our parents who are too old to be on some of these platforms like Twitter would actually get these 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 documents via WhatsApp. So if I, if for example I I take that report. Uh, that was published by Daily Maverick and send it to my aunt in the rural areas. It's written in English. It's written in a language she's unlikely to 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 understand. It wouldn't do. It wouldn't say much to her. But if it were to be translated into Ndebele, I'm sure she would completely understand it. So I really believe that um, the messages that we're sending to each other on Twitter and some of these platforms are not reaching the rest of the population and that is something we, the the tweets that we share amongst each other every day should find their way out there whether via whatsapp or other platforms that that people use or flyers or whatever but yeah i i don't think that uh, it's true to say as writers we have disseminated this information enough people are not getting the information. You'll find that very few people know about the drug scandal that that uh, shook Twitter. You know, mm. if you go to the rural areas today and you tell them 
Obadiah Moy was implicated in a scandal. They, they don't know what you're talking about. You know, they, right. many people don't even know the extent to which the president himself is implicated in these corruption scandals. So we have to find a way to bridge the information, to bridge the gap between social media and the people on the ground. I don't like this people on the ground statement because it has been used <laughs> against me for so long to say we are not on the ground. And I'm like, I mean, there's so many grounds, but uh, right. in this instant, I'll do that. Let's let's get, let let's build a bridge between these media platforms and the people on the ground. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Tandekile. And uh, Professor Maduku spoke about the. Uh, a way that we could use to not just expose these people, but to actually change uh, the powerful uh, the powerful lot. Uh, he gave an example of Donald Trump in the United States of America, how strong institutions can facilitate some of these uh, changes that we so desire. But here is a situation where we are in Zimbabwe. An electoral result does not reflect the will of the people and for example the 2018 election had to be settled by the constitutional court for us to be where we are now how uh we have all this information and you know the document points out to two key motivations for cartels the whole idea of rent seeking and political financing so we're dealing with people who have got the vanetinga zema resources essay and if they don't use the, if the money cannot buy them the votes, they go the route that Andekile spoke about earlier, the route of violence. Uh, you even uh, uh, spoke about it, uh, the culture of violence um, in our society in order for people to retain um, power whilst at the same time destroying the very thing that we all stand to be proud of, to say this is our Zimbabwe. What do we do? Dr. Magais, well, what direction well, should people take? Well, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, before I get to, to your question, I just wanted to add something to what Tanekia was saying, and perhaps it's also sure. part of answering, answering the question. Um, you guys are the journalists, you know, you are the media people, you know this better than myself, and uh, Professor Matuku, we are lawyers. But to my mind, uh, there are different uh, types of media. There are newspapers, and now we have social media, but uh, there is television and there is radio. Now, there is a very good reason why the Zanu PF regime has never really had a problem with newspapers. You know, private newspapers have been with us for a long time. You know, I can remember in the 1990s we had you know, things like the Daily Gazette, Sunday Gazette, the Mirror, and so forth. So it, it doesn't really worry much about newspapers. It's happy to allow, you know, private actors to, to have a role in there. Uh, now, you must ask yourself, for many, many years, it has had a monopoly on radio. And it has had a monopoly on radio through ZBC. And even when it opened the airwaves, it continued to have what I would call a pseudo monopoly because the you know entities that were given licenses were all aligned to Zanupia, to the government. And there's a good reason for that, because the most powerful media is, is radio in our in our countries. Because radio is what people listen to. Radio is what connects a uh, my gogo or sekuru in the village to Harare or to Ulawai. That's how, you know, I remember growing up in the rural areas. You know, that, that was our connection. And everyone had a regular routine. You know, they, we knew what program was coming. And here's the most important thing. We believed everything that was said on radio, you know, which is why, in particular, you know, we often talk about Kuburaundi and why other people may not have, you know, participated or not. It's because they were fed propaganda. And people believe this propaganda, you know, the same way that they continue to, to spew the propaganda and people in rural areas and other places who have no access to any other source of information, they believe that. So, in my opinion, uh, we cannot go very far in creating consciousness 
or creating counter narratives unless unless we use the power of radio and this is where you guys with the new media you know social media you should be able to make use of of, of uh, you know platforms even if it means pre-recorded stuff which is then disseminated via whatsapp via the platforms that are free and open for other people and that must be done you know there is there is nothing stronger than people listening when they will be doing work they'll be cooking in the kitchen in that hut they'll be sitting by the fireside you know panari, outside or whatever they're doing and they'll be listening to radio you know they won't be reading papers they won't be reading things so we need to use the most effective ways of communicating with people zero fear but i think that very well <laughs> which is why it is maintaining a monopoly or a near monopoly on, on on radio so for me it's really it's really critical uh you talked about, you know, Professor Maduk was talking about elections, and I mean, his qualification was that, uh, his qualification was that, um, you know, in, in America, in older democracy, there are strong institutions, and so if uh, they don't want a leader like they did once President Trump, they refuse to give him a second term. Now, we know that is difficult in Zimbabwe and in many countries, Uganda, Tanzania, we have seen all these elections in Africa. It's such a, it's such a huge challenge. But um, I've always said, and, and Tadekele has already made the point as well as uh, Professor Matuku, people need to understand that they have a right to get together, to challenge. They are the ones who confer the authority to govern. And therefore, they can withdraw that authority to govern if they wish to withdraw it. But for them to do that, they have to be, you know, conscientized. You know, speaking of radio, you know, the guerrilla armies, the Zanda and the Zipra, they recognized that they needed to get people behind them. And what did they do? They had their radios, like Radio Mozambique, which was communicating to people here to tell them who they were. They were countering the propaganda that was being spewed by the Smith regime. We are not doing that enough. You know, we are doing something, we write, we do this, but we are not using the proper media in order to get people to really understand and appreciate the extent of uh, the challenges that uh, that they are facing and that they have the power in their hands at the moment people are still unsure whether they have power or not but they do and professor Maduro did say that uh, you know it, it, there is nothing in history that has ever been done to change an authoritarian regime that does not involve risk it does and uh, at some point we have to accept that uh, you know we would need to take those risks Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Magaisa. Uh, welcome back, uh, Mr. Mtasa. You came back. We were just continuing the conversation around the document that was released uh, on the cartels in Zimbabwe. So we were just looking at some of the contributions that uh, had been made from the observations around the impressions that our panelists have on that document. So, um, I'm going to hand over back to you, but maybe just um, as we, we we move on to the next uh, uh, point, there are these comments that people are. So I just want to read some of them so that um, you know we keep ourselves with the viewers. Thank you so much, uh, comrade, for coming through. We can see you are here, Olin. How do we stop digging and how do we get out? I think this question continues uh, to come out because the two routes that uh, the professor proposed do not seem to be working at the present moment. Uh, Zimbabwe has leadership crisis with looters at the helm who think about themselves and not an ordinary person. Should we as citizens stand aside and look without doing anything? What's the best strategy to remove ourselves from the jaws of the crocodile? The same question uh, that continues to arise. Very powerful deliberations here. We need to come up with a clear roadmap on how do we remove this government. Hashtag Demloot. Thank you so much, Barbara, for coming through. We have Godfrey. 
uh goodbye sorry goodbye chinyaka he said prof maduku this cartel lost elections clearly in 2008 and there was no transition of power they hold results for six weeks so can elections in work in zimbabwe if we uprise they kill us with live bullets because soldiers are the ones at the helm what are the strategies besides these two um failed options there comes again that same question no malang i say in zimbabwe we need independent judiciary all our supreme court high court judges should be flushed out they are not there for the people of zimbabwe the whole bench have dirty hands they are biased and they are only there for the corrupt ruling uh cartel thank you so much no malanga for coming through um cheapers so you, you said i think entry point is for media to educate masses on a who is looting? B, what motivates them? C, from whom? And D, to what effect? Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming through. Keep on sending your contribution. Goodbye, you come back again and say there is no independent media in Zimbabwe, worse in the form of radio and television. The looters knows that the majority of the people are not informed. The commissions like Media Commission is full of the cartel proxy and they cannot allow registration of pure independent radio and TV stations. We need to find strategies to remove the current regime now these are the comments coming in from our viewers and they are asking the same question what strategy what strategy so i'll get back to you mr mtasa please take over thank you for for standing by and that was a good stand, um, uh, um, arrangement we made there the crisis that uh, dr magaisa was talking about electricity has just gone off and um, the alternative failed to work, but we then got to the third option. And this is how Zimbabweans are living. We are going for different options until you find what suits you. But uh, I, I don't know whether you had looked at the pos potential role um, of, uh, of parliament and uh, other constitutional institutions. So broadly, what are the legal options besides the political options that we have spoken about, what are the other legal options that are available? Is there a role for parliament and constitu constitutional institutions? Dr. Magais. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm, I'm happy that you raised that, uh, you know, uh, uh, President. Uh, we, we, we must make a distinction between what works in a normal country you know, a proper democracy where there are institutions that are created in order to provide checks and balances and they actually perform that work. As we are seeing in America today, you know, with the impeachment process taking place, even though, you know, President Trump has left office, uh, but there is still something taking place. Now, and unfortunately, you know, this is sort of regime with the cartels that are around it, are not interested in building institutions that work. They are not interested in creating institutions that provide those checks and balances. I mean, just take a look at how the current president, Emerson Mnangagwa, has sort of mutilated the whole anti-corruption system by this organization or this unit that he calls the Special Anti-Corruption Unit, which is based in his office. How do you put a watchdog in your office? And that watchdog is supposed to look into what that office does. You know, in many other countries, including ours, a lot of corruption takes place at the very highest levels of government, including in the president's office. But you house the anti-corruption unit in that office. It's obviously not going to do anything to investigate or to challenge the cartels that are connected to the presidency. So that was way of simply saying that I'm going to talk about corruption, but you know, I'm going to try and do something about corruption as long as it doesn't involve me or involve people who are connected to me. No wonder why you see that whenever there is an issue that involves or that has some link to members of the, his family, 
uh, to members of uh, who are connected to you know the highest office the drugs affair is, a, is one example in you know, our the covid 19 procurement the gold smuggling by Andreeta Rushwaya in October is another. You know, the, the president's wife writes a statement and the police ends up actually writing a statement exonerating the, the, the president's wife. I mean, all those things demonstrate to you that institutions of the state have become compromised. You know, that anti-corruption unit is an insult to the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission which is supposed to be the constitutional body, which must have independence to deal with corruption. It cannot be independent when a unit that is supposedly doing something about corruption is housed in the office of the president. It compromises the entire independence of the anti-corruption strategy. And likewise, it also compromises the national prosecuting authority. So in my opinion, there is no will there is no desire to create an anti-corruption mechanism that actually deals with the challenges that we are having. And um, when you talk about legal options, you know the legal options would normally be with the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission, the National Prosecuting Authority, the police. But when you have the whole system diluted and compromised by presidential power in this manner, then I think that um, you know expecting something to happen would be expecting the sun to rise from the west and it's not going to happen um so the legal options you know you can say that they're on paper but in reality there is not much to it i will tell you you know zimbabweans we need to understand that what works is political pressure there are no authoritarian regimes that have ever changed their way of doing things unless they have been faced with political pressure. I mean, I'm always at a loss when people ask questions. Tell us what to do. What strategy should we do? Everybody knows what they should do, but they just they just want someone to say, do you hear them all by waiting for a signal? To do what? You know that you need to put political pressure on a regime that is so stubborn, that is so intransigent. Is it going to use violence? Of course it's going to use violence. But if you are going to keep aside, wait aside and say someone is going to do it, well, we're going to have, that's why they say sometimes you get the government that you deserve because you are happy to let them do what they have to do. And that's why they're so arrogant. That's why you see those young boys, you know, who parade their beautiful cars, you know, you, know, you, you see them with lots of money on the table. You know, they are so rude. They are so arrogant. They even come to Twitter. And they tell you we are hardworking people, yet they are stealing. They do that because they know that Zimbabwe will fold their arms and, and let it be. It never happens in other countries. You know, when they see these things, they go after them. But we, sure. you know, we, we have this and we, we accept it. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Raising very fundamental issues. And I want to go to Kandekle. I can't ask you the same question. I know where you stand uh, between uh, reforms and revolution. So let's go straight to where you stand, revolution. The revolution is said not to be going to be televised. Um, uh, the singer said so, saying so. It's not going to be properly planned, televised. We hire BBC, we call ENCA, SABC. So what, what, when you talk about the revolution, what is in your mind? What is in your mind? What sort of, uh, how is it going to come about? So, um, as you said, I mean, my position on this is, is crystal clear. In a captured state where the courts are captured and you know that even if you, you, you file a lawsuit or even if you try and build a criminal case against any of the perpetrators, you're never going to win. The only option in a captured state is a non-violent uprising. And this is a situation whereby the people of Zimbabwe rise up against the state capture that is happening now. And I believe it is the responsibility of each and every one of us to stand up against this oppression. There, there is nobody that can save Zimbabwe because this problem that is happening is, it's, it, it, 
it is us who are being oppressed and it is us that can remove ourselves from this oppression. It's like when a, a woman is married to an abusive husband, there is nobody that can remove that woman from that marriage except the woman herself, you know, because, you know, so, so what's, what is happening to Zimbabweans is like us being, I'll, I'll use the analogy of a marriage because a, a person chooses who they want to be married to the same way that we must choose who we want to lead us. And if you are married to a controlling person, an abusive person who keeps you in that marriage against your will. The, the, the only way to get out of it is either death or resistance. So Zimbabweans have to resist against this abuser, this oppressor. We really have to find a way to stand up against the oppression. Otherwise, it's going to happen forever. So the government also knows this. I think the government knows this better than we do. That's why you find them targeting anybody who speaks about a revolution. If you look at this young man, Alan Moyo, who has been in prison for 66 days now, you will find that the only difference between Alan Moyo and all these other people that have been uh, arrested before and released on bail is that Alan Moyo went to the bus terminus and spoke to people about rising up against this government. And that is the one thing that the government fears because they know that is the only thing that can remove them. So what Zimbabweans must realize is that we now have to find that same bravery that pushed Alan Moyo, Takuto Angadzuwari, and all these other young people to go out to the people and say, let us rise up against this government that is oppressing us. That is what we need to find amongst ourselves. And the sad thing is that um, an uprising, like you said, is not something that you can plan, you know, because one, we are in a state that will kill anybody that tries to organize for an uprising. And we're in a state that is so heavily infiltrated that if three of us sit down today and say on the look at what happened with the 31st of july movement for as long as you publicize that on the 31st of july we're going to rise up against the government it's a waste of time you know so what we need to do before the people of zimbabwe are ready to rise up against the government is to build the momentum help everybody to be brave enough to say we need a revolution because that is all i believe that's the only thing that can save zimbabwe a revolution against this government that is oppressing us and, and civil society has to be brave enough to say it you find that civil society organizations always distance themselves from the struggle by saying we are not political because they're afraid that if they say their struggle is political they are going to be uh, persecuted. But I find that a, a, a very selfish position, I'm sorry to say, because it means that you are protecting your financial resources and not that which you claim to be fighting for. Because civil society's fight is political. You cannot run away from that. If you are fighting for the rights of people, it means that your fight is political. But the moment you distance yourself from the politics to save the funds that are meant to fight a political battle, you are really failing the people that you're fighting for. So Zimbabweans have to be brave enough and to be selfless enough to say, this fight is political and we are going to die if we're going to continue this fight. This is one thing that we must accept and understand that many of us in this fight are not going to, to, to be alive to, to see the freedom that we are fighting for. So yes, people are going to die. I saw people in the comment section saying the army will shoot us. Yes, they're going to shoot us. It's the reason why we are fighting. We're fighting because we have a government in power that is killing people to stay in power. So even if we stay at home, they're still going to be killing us. They're killing us because they have completely neglected the health sector. If you, if you find the true statistics of how many people are dying each day because our health sector is underfunded by the government, you will realize that the number of people that are going to be shot by the, the, the army if we ever have an uprising will pale in comparison. People die in Zimbabwean hospitals every single day. Our education 
has completely died. Public, there, there is no public education in Zimbabwe, COVID-19 or no COVID-19, because what the government has done is they've completely neglected their role to provide education to Zimbabweans. And what kind of future is Zimbabwe supposed to have with an uneducated generation? Because only children that are going to private schools are the ones getting an education. So what this basically means is that 20 years time, this literacy race, rate that we have been bragging about will be non-existent. So by trying to protect ourselves from being shot by the army, what we are doing is, is killing the country further. So we have to stand up against these people. If it means that we die, then we die. But without that, we are going to die and will remain in power, looting, and our children will not have a chance at, at a normal life. So we we have to forget about elections, I'm sorry, but uh, what is the point of having, of, of putting our trust in an election that is controlled by ZEC, which is controlled by ZANU-PF? None of these things are ever going to work. What we need in Zimbabwe is a revolution, and a revolution can only come once all Zimbabweans agree that ZANU-PF must go. And the only way for ZANU-PF to go is through a nonviolent uprising. And uh, all I can do is to implore uh, strong voices in society to, to stand up and say, we need a revolution because I believe that's all we need. You, you asked me how it's going to be done. I don't know how it's going to be done because it's, it's, it's not a decision that can be made by one person. It is supposed to be a social contract or an agreement among Zimbabweans that ZANU-PF must go. And once we agree that ZANU-PF must go, we should then be able to get out into the streets and say, even if they shoot us, we are going to remove this regime from power. Luta Continua, thank you very much. And I want to thank you and uh, comrades for, for, for this uh, very powerful conversation. But I want to abuse you before you leave. Uh, but before that, may um, the technical team put uh, page 27 of the report. Uh, I would, I'd like to have a, word, a, a few words with the working class. Uh, if we can have page 27, but as we prepare uh, page 27 and page 34 later. As we prepare, um, I would like uh, the two panelists who are still here to think about this. What is your word of advice to the workers of Zimbabwe? And um, say what there, I would, I would be glad if you can also put it in Shona. We need a short um, uh, clip to uh, send to workers, English and Shona, and I would be glad if Tandekle you can put also in Isidevele. So we, we want workers to look at this um, just on one transaction, uh, the Zimbabwean dollar lost 23%. This 23% was not a result of production. It was just a transfer from workers, from peasant farmers, from people who are productive in this country. So all of us, if you are a cotton farmer, if you are a tobacco farmer, if you are a worker in the informal economy, if you are a worker in the formal economy, they lost that 23%. It was transferred from us to um, uh, Sakunda there through one transaction. And uh, we still feel it. Let's go to page 34 and hear what the uh, research found in terms of uh, what happened because of uh, such transactions. If you go to page 34, you'll see that... Um, there was erosion of salaries, uh, erosion of salaries and uh, pensions. So automatically the working class lost. And these are the things that we need to look at. What, what, who are the losers, who are the winners? And the losers are you and me. And this is why we are having these conversations to try and see how best we can um, deal with these issues, poor service delivery, the panelists were talking about our hospitals, our schools, and everything. We are a nation in crisis. In the next uh, dialogue, we want to talk to the panelists about 
whether we are now a failed state. But um, thank you very much, uh, comrades, for coming. I'll go to uh, Dr. Magaisa, your parting shots. To the, this is specifically to the okay. workers of Zimbabwe and citizens of Zimbabwe. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll start by saying in English that, uh, you know, the ZCTU is a very important institution in our country. Um, you know, growing up as a young person, you know, that was, if you want to call it a civil society organization, you know, that was the civil society group that we knew, you know, representing workers, you know, outside politics, but representing the interests of workers. Uh, on matters of the human rights, I remember it was Zimrat. You know, so we knew there was something called Zim rights and the ZCTU, very powerful. Uh, and I'm happy to see that, uh, you know, it continues to uh, to lead the way in protecting workers and having solidarity with workers in other parts of the world. I think that's very important to, to build that network. Uh, but it's important for people to know that everything that is taking place, the looting, the corruption, even at government level, ultimately affects you as a worker because you are the taxpayers. You are the ones who you know, pay taxes either as workers, your income tax, but also the VAT, you know, value-added tax when you buy goods. You know, all these uh, target fees, they are all taxes you know, that you are paying. The 2% tax when you buy stuff, these are all the funds that you are paying. So you are the ones who are looting. You are, in fact, funding the lifestyle of these few elites. And this is a point that I always wanted to make and I keep making in what I'm writing, and I'm happy to be saying so. That when you see an MP or a business person who is connected to ZPF driving a Lamborghini, driving a, a, a Rolls Royce, you know, a Ferrari, building these uh, 32 bedroom houses, the mansions, they are doing so on the back of your money, your resources. You are the ones who can stop it, you know. And so you have to take an interest in the looting and the corruption that is taking place. You cannot outsource it to the opposition political parties and say, what are they doing? Ultimately, the power is in your hand as workers. Muchiwan, Muchishwana, Dributi, Vashandi Rose, Vanupan Rose, Yakuti, Ku Shunguruzwa, Quesa Kurmitiko, Kuba, Quesa Kurmitiko, a Kuluta, Kurmitiko, Nevan Pamsur, Vavano, Italian Matung, Renikanisha Matrao, a Jimenguku Bada, Kuba Quesa Kuritreko, Neguti, Jimono Bada Muteroga, Mutero, Unakuru, Mutero, Income Tax, and Yamno Tambira Marin. Shomayo, Kutambura kukunzwa, ni wanu wa shoma niani? Wanu wa ndiyo, wanu kutora jese, inga wairi fonji na murukurima, inga wairi goride, likuchelu wale makurukoza, inga wairi ma diamonds, kwa na marange, jese iji, tuluwa mchiwa, jukana nishandis kwa uti iji, gazile jipatara, jukazile mkwa kwa, wanu wa ndi mkuro za kanaka, imimi, mashandi, mbadalu wa mkuu, Unota zika uti awa, awa nji teacher, awa nji wampulisa, awa nji wamkoji. Asa amuskupuwa shini zozo, ni uti mariri kupiwa ni wana wa shoma nini. Wani wa umari za laina zika wana zika uti, wana kwa nisa kubadara zika uti, nika ino. Asa rungura mba wachingu mwora, wachingu otora, ni uti ndoza wa jaira. Ende one kuti, hapana za mungi ita, za tuku ita siwa shandi, kutitiwa mise, tiwa zise. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for those last words. I want to go to Comrade uh, Tandekile, the same 
uh, parting shots, words to the working class. Okay, sorry, uh, before I get to the words to the working class, uh, I think I see in the comments uh, a question about uh, why the revolution. So can I just take a minute to, to try and explain that? Mm -hmm. So when I say we need a revolution, uh, I don't think the aim of a revolution is to remove ZANU-PF from power and place somebody else. I believe that the aim of a revolution is to remove ZANU-PF from power and then rebuild our weak institutions. We are in the position that we are in today because all our inf institutions have been weakened and infiltrated by ZANU-PF. So earlier someone mentioned the, the example of how Donald Trump was removed because they are strong institutions. This is the situation that we want as a country to try and get to. A revolution will remove ZANU-PF from power. And once we have done that, we need to find experts either among ourselves or experts from a body uh, like the UN, which has done that for so many other countries before, where they then strengthen the institutions of a particular nation through uh, in, in, a, in a transitional stage where we transition from after ZANU-PF to the next election. So between the time after the revolution and the next election, Zimbabwe needs to concentrate on trying to rebuild our institutions. We need to make sure that our army is independent. We'll have to make sure that our electoral commission is independent. Our judiciary has to be independent. So it's all about strengthening our institutions because once we have strong institutions, what, then, what, what that means is that Zimbabweans will now have the power to install the leaders that they want. Because we are in this situation because we don't have the leaders that we want. We don't have the leaders that we want because the people that have been in power since 1980 have infiltrated all the institutions that should give us the leaders that we want. So we need to fight to remove them, strengthen our institutions. Only after that can we have free and fair elections. So I really don't think it matters who's going to get into power after ZANU-PF. What matters is that after ZANU-PF is gone, the revolution continues to strengthen our institutions. And then we have a free and fair election where anybody that Zimbabweans want can get into power. And if that person fails, because we would have taken the time to build strong institutions, it means that person can be removed again. We don't want a one-party state. We want democracy. And democracy can only be achieved by strong institutions. And then uh, I'll you know, go to the you question. Know, you, you know what, Tandekile? I wouldn't yes. mind you I wouldn't mind you being the president of the new Zimbabwe. I don't think I, I want to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> well things can change, but uh, I, I I love the freedom that comes with holding people uh, accountable. <laughs> so Thanks. yeah but thanks for the vote of confidence. Uh, and then to the workers, I think the workers are actually the people that can change our situation right now because all the work that is being done by Zimbabweans is funding ZANU-PF and is funding oppression because teachers are waking up every single day going to teach children for free it means that the money that is supposed to go towards education is going to ZANU-PF. So teachers are volunteering their services each and every day of their lives to fund the lifestyle of, of, of ZANU-PF. Workers are, are enabling this situation because we as Zimbabweans have said it's fine, ZANU-PF can loot, but we're good-hearted people. So we'll continue to teach children for free. People that work for Zinara, which is implicated in this uh, report by Daily Maverick, wake up every single day of their lives to go and collect toll fees so that they hand them over to ZANU-PF. So Zimbabweans as a whole have volunteered their services for free so that the president and everybody in ZANU-PF has a good lifestyle at our expense. So the worker really has to refuse. They, we have to resist as workers in Zimbabwe the, this, this urge to keep on going to work for nothing. It, it, we were working for nothing because there is no salary. And those that worked when the salaries were even better have nothing to show for it because NASA has been looted to the ground. We have 
Priscilla, uh, her, her name has just <laughs> slipped my mind. But what's her name, by the way? Umira. The, 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 the Umira. NASA minister, yes, who, who looted a hundred million dollars. And she's living pretty, you know, she's at home right now, living off the proceeds of that looting. But workers are still going to work despite that. I believe that workers really have to get to a point where they say enough is enough and we all come together as workers in different environments doctors unions teachers unions all workers unions need to come together and 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 explain to their members that there is no point in continuing to work just so that zanu pf can fund their violence and can fund their oppression of zimbabwe's and ngesindebele engingakubuza abantu ukuthi kumele umuntu azibuze ukuthi vele ngisebenzelana ngisebenzelana mina kumbe ngisebenzela izanu ukuthi iqhubeke isincindezela iqhubeke ithathe imali yonke esiyenza ngoba akula mtu oholayo akula umuntu othola anything from oem 17 so i really do not think ukuthi ukusebenza ezimbabwe kunceda anyone ngaphandle kokunceda izanu pf so njengabantu bezimbabwe so kumele sibuzane ukuthi xa uyikuthi wonke sikwenzayo imsebenzi yonke esiyenzayo ayisinceda kuyine singakwenza there is no way we can stop working so let's remove the cancer let it, let's let's remove that person that is taking our earnings and make sure it's for the good of the country and not for zanu pf to keep oppressing us oh thank you very much uh quite uh, so statements but very courageous statements and also uplifting to the working class you know what both of you i would need you in our labor in our labor forums so that you speak to workers directly <laughs> And because I'm a president, I also uh, do what all the presidents are doing, dictating that uh, we'll continue to invite you to our dialogues. But you raise very important aspects. A domestic worker is earning nine US dollars, only sufficient to buy nine loaves of bread. I don't think we saw that in colonial Rhodesia or in apartheid South Africa. The minimum wage is 2,549, which is 25 US dollars conservatively if we use conservative exchange rates. And this is 25 loaves of bread. And this is what we are working for. And you are all correct. We need to reflect as workers and think about this. I, I, I was talking to my brother and I was saying, we know and we know they, they are going to kill activists and they may kill me. They poisoned me and uh, God saved me. But uh, my greatest fear is dying and probably going to life after death and see if it's possible uh, the workers carrying on as usual the ZCTU carrying on as if nothing has happened and that is a great fear that uh, my kids will not enjoy uh, the better life and the better Zimbabwe that would have died for so thank you very much uh, Dr Alex uh, Magaisa thank you mm -hmm. comrade uh, Tandekile Moyo on the revolution who save us and uh, thank you in absentia uh, Professor Maduku, and uh, thank you to all the technical comrades, Yvonne, you did a wonderful job there. Let's continue the conversation. The Worker Dialogue is going to call all, pre all political leaders. We now need to talk to them all, um, political leaders, the ruling party, and those in opposition on the same conversation. And we are also going to talk to the civic society, uh, uh, taking it up from where Tandekile left, and I'll call you to come and provoke us and leave. Then we start talking as civic society <laughs> from what you've seen. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, be blessed. Most welcome. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Dem loot, dem loot, dem loot, dem loot. Oh, dem loot, Zimbabwe dry. Dem loot, dem loot, dem loot, dem loot, dem loot. Oh, all the people die. Dem loot, dem loot, dem loot, dem loot. No medication in hospitals. Them loot, them loot, them loot Schools have no books, them loot 
them loot, them loot, them loot. The ghetto youth have no jobs, them loot. Them loot, them loot, them loot. Lord of mercy. Them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. Oh, them loot, them loot, them loot. Lord of mercy. God have mercy. Them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. Oh, all the people die. While the people cry, 